The White Pill is available now at whitepillbook.com. This episode is brought to you by Patriot Gold. Oh boy, oh boy, we are in for a treat. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Malice, and let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us one of my good friends, God Sad, whose new book, uh, The Sad Truth About Happiness, is out now and is doing very well. I want to give a little backstory to uh, this book and this episode, because um, Gad and I, I think, in many ways have similar personalities. He's an evolutionary professor of psychology. He's written his other book, The Parasitic Mind, has done Gangbusters, which I've read and enjoyed. Um, I made it a point not to read this book so we can discuss it on the air and encourage people to, from your own words, uh, why they should read it. And I'm very excited to hear it. One of the things I want to point out, a lot of times when I have guests on, people wonder what they're like in real life. And I was on Gavin McGingis's podcast, must have been 10 years ago, and I said I don't use the word friend because the word friend is not informative because you use the word friend for someone you work with, my friend at work, and you use the word friend for the person you call when your mom dies. And these are not conceptually the same person. Uh, so I always say good friend, and my definition of good friend is someone who I have spent time with one-on-one -on -one and talked about uh, – personal important issues that's so when you hear me say good friend that that's what that means one of the reasons i became an author is i didn't want to have a boss i didn't want to have an alarm clock i didn't ever want to talk to anyone i didn't want to or have small talk and the thing about gad sad is when you have conversations with him in real life there's never small talk it's really interesting important issues but that's great because what do I need to sit down and just blather about? Oh, can you believe what Biden did today? Or, oh my God, this heat wave in Austin is absolutely crazy. So uh, it's always a treat to spend time talking to you and discussing things with you. And let's talk before we get into the book about advice. I don't like to give advice because most people don't really want advice. They want validation, right? So you and I have both given people each other advice because it comes from a place of respect. It comes from a place, okay, this person is coming at me in an informed place and a place of sympathy and empathy. But when I give advice, I always give advice. I give the person the background. So I say, I would do this because this story happened to me. So they have as much information as I do instead of just giving some cookie cutter, fortune cookie cliche. It's like, okay, this is how I came to this conclusion. So the big question is, and this is quite the intro, why are you in a position to tell people about happiness? Yeah, thanks, Michael. First, thank you for the lovely introduction. That was very kind of you. Uh, well, in the first chapter, I actually talk about how I came to write this book. I, you know, if you would have asked me, when I sat down to write The Parasitic Mind, if my next book would be a book on happiness, I would have said there's almost zero chance that that would happen. But that's the beauty of life. There is all kinds of serendipitous forces that you know organically move us to a new direction. In my case, it was really a combination of a few factors. One, uh, whenever I would post something that seemed prescriptive in nature. Now, let me just, just explain what I mean by that term. As a academic a behavioral scientist as an academic psychologist you know i'm not a clinician and so i usually operate in the descriptive world i'm simply trying to conduct studies to describe why people do the things that they do contrary to say a clinical psychologist who's hopefully going to prescribe some optimal course of action for you and i try to shy away from prescriptive uh you know as you said advice because I thought, well, you know, for me to give advice, it has to be airtight. I have to absolutely be able to defend why I'm giving this exact advice and so on. And so I shied away from that. But then whenever I would post on social media, you know, here are the ways by which I've lost a lot of weight. That would typically be some of the most uh, impactful content. People would write to me and say, my God, that's changed my life. I've actually implemented what you said and I've so far lost 32 pounds. So that was one factor. The second one was that I would get tons of emails from people saying, how is it that you always seem to be playful and you're all, even when you're, you know, 
criticizing someone on Twitter, you you seem to you know have a twinkle in your eye, even when you insult someone, it seems like you're being playful. What's your or magic? Why are you always? Why do you seem to be happy? And so I thought, you know what? Why don't I take a shot? Given these uh, two forces that I just said, uh, take a shot at actually putting it all together. So the book really is a combination of my personal anecdotes. We are a storytelling animal. We we learn yes. best when we tell stories. Coupled with ancient wisdoms, because I'm hardly the first guy to write about happiness. Probably the topic that's been most talked about by philosophers over you know millennia is you know the good life, and then backed up by contemporary science. Put that together, and hopefully you come up with a good melange. You know, it's it's interesting what you say because I think, and I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I think there is a huge um, prejudice, for lack of a better term, in our media culture against happiness. There is this cynicism where if you want to seek happiness, you're either naive or childish um, or there's something wrong with you and real people are miserable and cynical and all this other stuff. I absolutely despise this. I, I'm thinking specifically of two moments. Uh, when Ayn Rand was on Donahue in 1979, there's this amazing, you know, she was, she was kind of a hard woman to put it mildly. Um, you know, he had this moment, he goes, you have liberated thousands of people with your novels by telling them if you want to do it, do it. And, and the audience uh, you know, applauds and she goes, if, if I could help them, I'm delighted. And I met her protege, Nathaniel Brandon, uh, in 97 at the Cato Institute 25th anniversary. And he sent me a copy of his book. It was, I think, The Psychology of Living Consciously. And he just signed it, Be Happy, to Michael Be Happy. And he said his goal, you know, even at a young age, was to encourage people to seek their happiness. But I do you not agree that there is this sneering like, oh, you want to be happy? That's cute. Some of us have to put food on the table uh, attitude that comes out <laughs> of urban media circles. You laugh, but I think it's extremely sinister. Right. No, that you're right. But but the reason why I had that reaction when you said that he, that the gentleman signed Be Happy is because I just came back from uh, speak, a speaking engagement at the Commonwealth Club in uh, San Francisco. And so there were, uh, you know, some people waiting to, to have me, you know, sign their book. And the the thing that I signed was, you know, tell me what your name is, dear Michael. And then it was just be happy exclamation oh. point and then my signature. <laughs> that's amazing. So, so, wow. that, that, yeah, that's why I was like, I couldn't oh, believe that that was just that's like, fortuitous. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm guessing that uh, I, I can't speak to whether, you know, there's, you know, real uh, uh, finding that agrees with what you're saying. But anecdotally, you're right that many people think that you know, life is about suffering, as the yes. saying goes. And uh, so to be happy seems some, somewhat counterintuitive to that ethos. Although I should say to that point, in the last chapter of the book, I, I use a quote from Viktor Frankl. And the quote is about success. And he's arguing that you don't willfully pursue success. Success is something that is the downstream effect of you having made you know good decisions and i thought perfect i'm going to use that quote but you know replace success by happiness so in other words yeah. i don't wake up or i'm guessing you don't wake up saying you know what are the specific you know behavioral patterns that i should engage in today to be happy but rather if i make good choices if i adopt certain mindsets the downstream effect will be that i'm happy yeah, one of the reasons I became an author, another one is so that when I die, I can look at this bookshelf of things I've created and be like, all right, I did something with my life. And and I think everyone, well, I don't want to say everyone, but most people do have that capacity to, all we can ask, are asked to do is leave the world a little bit better place than when we found it. You know, I think that is kind of, and I think it's a low bar, but it's at the same time, it's easier said than done. And I, I think if you do have this kind of life accomplishment, it doesn't have to be being an author. It could be being a great dad. It could be a great, great mechanic, anything. It, it's just the possibilities are literally infinite. Uh, I, I think that happiness is when you could look at your choices and your accomplishments and be like, hey, you know what? I didn't do so bad. And But I think most people don't think in those terms and they think it's, it's something that they don't deserve. Yeah, I love that you said, uh, you know, I, I left off something and then you said that because I'm going to take those two threads and link them to something that I've argued in the past and in the, in the current book. So, you know, if you're religious, which is perfectly fine, actually, that there's a positive correlation between religiosity and happiness. Uh, if you're religious, one pathway 
to immortality is that you know you believe in an afterlife this is a temporary you know place that we're at but we're going to you know to some eternal future place but even if you're completely irreligious if you if you're a non-believer so to your exact two points i argue that there there are very clear ways well there are two ways by which i can be immortal i mean in a literal sense uh, number one by having children I am propagating my genes. My my children share fifty percent of my genes. Uh, this is why I'm willing to. I mean, it sounds cynical, but that's why I'm willing to jump in front of a bus and potentially kill myself to save my children. Because from an evolutionary calculus perspective, that makes perfect evolutionary sense. They they literally are an instantiation of my potential immortality. But the second way to your other point is what I call mimetic immortality, right? Meme is a term that was you know, introduced into the lexicon by Richard Dawkins. And mimetic immortality might be that, as you said, when you die, may you live a long life, uh, you know, people will be consuming your book. Your ideas will be infecting their brains, to use a metaphor from my previous book. Now, you can, you can have that mimetic immortality in an endless number of ways, right? Dave Chappelle is going to be immortal because, I, you know, we can go back after he passes and listen to his uh, incredible routines and those will live on forever. The architect who put up the Golden Gate Bridge, which I uh, drove on a few days ago in San Francisco, is immortal through the things he's done. So whether you are religious or not, there are ways by which you can seek that ultimate goal of being immortal. So what, what do you think, I, th I think the issue is when you're young, um, it seems you don't, you see, you, you know, like when you're 20 to 25, you're a lot smarter than when you were a teenager, obviously infinitely smarter. You have infinitely more responsibilities. You know, you're a much better place at the same time. You're a complete idiot, a buffoon. Like this is kind of the universal experience. And it's this weird place because objectively you're much, much, much smarter than you were before. But in the other terms, you just also don't have the data. So you're kind of stumbling around. And one of the things that I enjoy is, you know, there's some, I have a, I have a protege Trey, who's just this great kid who reminds me of myself when I was his age, when things that I've gone through and were not fun to put it mildly, when I see him having these situations, I can very easily be like, oh no, 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 no. Like don't just, just do A, B and, or instead of C. Cause in a way it's almost like time travel where I could go back in time to myself and be like, sit myself down and go, here's the answer. You don't have to go through all this suffering. And this kind of marginally makes, you know, utility or happiness, uh, um, you know, increase. Is that a great, I mean, I, I know this is kind of a softball question, but that must be an enormous source of joy for you as a professor. When you see these bright, high achieving students of yours, you know, they sit down with you and they go on to accomplish great things. Oh no, it's actually a beautiful question. Thank you. I mean, you know, I walk in day one with a new batch of students. And yeah. I very quickly can gauge. So I start with my whole evolutionary psychology speech and how, you know, once you understand the evolutionary lens, it opens you up in terms of the explanatory power. You'll understand why you were jealous at your girlfriend or, or boyfriend the day before. You'll understand why you're seeking the corner office with the, the most amount of windows because it's a status symbol and, and on and on and on. And I literally see their faces almost, you know, kind of opening up you know, in, in complete awe, because it's the first time that they are hearing of this parsimonious framework that will hopefully allow them to navigate the world, uh, you know, with a, with a bit of greater ease, because they understand why they do the things that they do. So I get it. That's one of the reasons why being a professor is such a beautiful thing. Of course, doing the research is very important. Now, I should say, just on a negative end, uh, while I, you know, it's it's in my DNA to be a professor. I've, I've always, you know, I was, I was only good at two things in life, soccer player. And, you know, I was a very studious kid. And so I knew that I wanted to lead an intellectual cerebral life. Some of the administrative elements of uh, yeah, being a of professor course. have certainly affected my ability to be fully happy in my job uh, and the older that i've gotten and so the the, the greater the demand on my time it, it, it's no longer as fun to hold office hours to explain to timmy why he received the b minus when he almost never participated in class so those are the, the the mechanics of being a professor that i could do without but certainly to your point when you are first introducing them to all of these ideas and you see their faces light up my god i'm rich for being able to do that 
Folks, Jerome Powell and the Fed raised rates for the 11th time in July. The Hill has warned that it's a mistake that could spark a recession, and economists believe this is the last rate hike in the most aggressive rate hike cycle in history. And in fact, they're forecasting rate cuts in 2024. That's why bullish sentiment in gold for hedge funds just hit an 18-month high. And in fact, bullish sentiment for silver has risen at its fastest pace in more than five years years. JP Morgan Chase sees gold prices at record highs in 12 to 18 months. Rate hikes are typically headwinds for gold. Meanwhile, gold has gone up over 20% since 2022. Imagine where gold and silver are going to be when the Fed stops raising and starts cutting. So call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late and mention my name, Michael Malice. You'll always get best in class service from Patriots protecting Patriots. Patriot Gold Group has the No Fee for Life IRA, where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver, and you may be eligible for the No Fee for Life IRA on qualifying rollovers. Here's what you have to do. Call 888-505-9845 to get a free investor guide, or simply go to malicegold.com. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs' top-rated gold IRA dealer six years in a row, so please call 888-505-9845 or just go to malicegold.com. Let's get back to the show. Uh, I had a couple of epiphanies this week, and, and since you're here, let me pick your brain because this is your bread and butter evolutionary psychology. One of the points of evolutionary psychology is there's nowhere else to go. Uh, everything we do is a function in some sense of our evolutionary psychology. We are animals, not in a pejorative sense, but human beings are animals. And I always tell people, if you want to understand politics, watch uh, Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer, uh, because human beings and dogs co-evolved. And it'll be a lot easier to understand why people behave in certain ways to watch that show than to watch you know, CNN or Fox and have them talk about, well, the American people are smart. And once Mike Pence sits them down and explains this, then they're going to join his campaign. It's, it's completely fallacious and, and just to the point of absurdity and almost obscenity. Um, one of the I realizations I had, I kind of articulated specifically, is the idea that human beings aren't interested in seeking truth. Human beings are interested in seeking tools to further their goals. And truth is a very strong, effective tool. But if you have deception, including self-deception or manipulation, those will work just as well to further an agenda. So this enlightenment idea or ideal that if you have this marketplace of ideas and everyone sits down and sp speaks their truth articulately, the truth will win out. Maybe that's true over centuries, but in terms of the short or middle term, that's completely fallacious thinking. I want to hear your thoughts as a professional in this field. Oh, what a fantastic uh, question. I speak to that exact point in chapter seven of The Parasitic Mind, where the title of the chapter is How to Seek Truth. And there, what I I start off with a quote to your point from uh, Sperber, Dan Sperber and Hugo Mercier, two French cognitive psychologists who wrote, and, and also evolutionists, who wrote a book uh, called The Enigma of Reason, and where they argued, to your point, that the, the faculty to reason in humans did not evolve to seek some truth, but rather to win arguments. Right. And yeah. the reason why I put that as the opening quote, you know, in, you know, in my early in my chapter is because I was then going to offer some epistemological set of tools to argue that this is how you seek truth. But be careful if someone goes, la, 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 I don't want to hear it because they're not open to having the intellectual honesty to hear your thoughts because they just want to win the argument. Then I can't offer you a vaccine for that. Right. right. So. So the two interlocutors, when they come into that discussion, have to be willing to forego that evolutionary instinct of no, no matter what, I need to win the debate. And to that point, if I could just make a, one other very quick point, uh, earlier in the parasitic mind, where I'm talking about the two life ideals that, that shape my life, which are the pursuit of truth and the defense of uh, freedom, I tell the story uh, of a, a interaction I had had with a family member. This is my nuclear family, not my family of procreation. And I was having a conversation with this person whereby that person had, you know, flippantly said, oh, you know, those ancient Greeks, those Christians, they were so anti-Semitic. And I looked at that person, I said, I'm sorry, I don't mean to correct you, but the ancient Greeks were not Christian. 
He goes, no, what do you mean? The Greeks were are Christian. They were Christian. I said, well, as a matter of fact, you date the time period by the fact that they weren't Christian. It's before Christ yeah. that they existed. So when that person realized that there was no way that he could win that argument, then he did something that no one has been able to yet predict what it was. I don't know if you read that part of the parasitic mind, but I did read. I read your book. I enjoyed it, I, and, and it's funny. It must have gone to my subconscious because it's not coming to conscious memory. Uh, so what he did in the, in order to at all costs engage in an ego defensive mechanism when there is no way he could win the argument, he says, "Right, that's what I said. I said that they weren't Christian, and you said that they were." So he exactly knew that i knew that he was bullshitting we both knew that but now we use the word gaslighting but his desire to win the argument was so great that he had the chutzpah to look at me as if i am a goldfish who can't remember what three seconds ago which position we were each arguing so to your point regrettably most people wish to win arguments not seek the truth and, and also I, I, maybe not in this specific case in situations like this it's not impossible that this person actually believes what they just said, that their memory will, and you know, that. go ahead. Their memory will just yeah. kind of shift to validate what they just remember, what they just said. Exactly. And sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, there is an amazing theory by Robert Trivers, who some have argued is the greatest evolutionist since Charles Darwin. Now that's saying a lot. Uh, Robert Trivers is at the root of, you know, many of the biggest uh, insights in evolutionary psychology, uh, parental investment theory, uh, the whole range of reciprocal altruism. Uh, but the theory that's relevant to our current discussion is the evolution of self-deception. And so he's got a whole book on the topic. W why is it that we've evolved this uncanny ability to lie to ourselves? And the answer is, is breathtakingly simple and yet, you know, infinitely uh, profound. He says, look, in, in a social species, you and I, Michael, are often engaging in a kind of evolutionary arms race. I'm trying to manipulate you to suit my interests. You're trying to pick up if there is any duplicitous, manipulative intent in me when I'm telling you something. And so you're really cued to any possible signatures that I'm emitting, suggesting that I'm being duplicitous. And therefore, the way that I shut off those cues is by first believing in the lie myself. If yeah. I can convince myself of the lie, then it becomes a lot easier to lie to you, which I think is a brilliant insight. So yeah, there's a lot of evolutionary stuff to unpack there. So let, let's let's get back to discussing uh, about happiness. I, I, I mean, what broadly speaking, something that I find disturbing and is the amount of self-medicating and prescribed medicating there is in America. I mean, I think the numbers are just asymptotic and, and number of people being prescribed in term. And to me, it seems that in some cases, things like depression, anxiety do have a physiological basis. It could be, you know, your, it could be diet. It could be, you know, a million things. Um, but at the same time, it feels that if you're throwing a pill at it, you're not addressing in many cases the root cause. And not, a, not only that, the brain is so infinitely complicated. I think it's hubris to the nth degree to that we can think that, okay, you, every individual, you're going to take this pill and we it's like dominoes up there you, that you're going to know the exact consequences that just seems ridiculous on its face. So I'm curious your thoughts in the idea, in, you know, writing about happiness, the idea that depression, which is not the exact same thing as lacking happiness, is just being thrown by just like throw medicine at it and go F yourself. Right. I've, I've actually tackled this in, in several ways in some of my writings. So I've always been interested uh, to one of our earlier points, of, you know, why did I write a happiness book? I had thought myself uh, when I was trying to decide, you know, which which field in the behavioral sciences and psychology I wanted to study. I ended up doing psychology of decision making, consumer psychology, evolutionary psychology. But some of my early interests were in forensics, uh, psychiatry and in clinical psychology and uh, and psychiatry in general, I decided that, well, there were two reasons why I decided not why I didn't become a therapist myself. And then I'll come back to your question, but I'm giving you the background. Number one, uh, a lot of the therapeutic approaches in, in the history of clinical psychology and in psychiatry have been complete quackery, right? Someone comes up with some complete bullshit yeah. theory that's utterly 
devoid from you know a scientific grounding and it becomes very much driven by a cult of personality a, a guru is telling you that uh, you know everything that you ever experience is due to childhood repressed sexual trauma there's absolutely no proof of that but that's the mechanism and everybody has to believe it the second reason why i decided i didn't want to become a therapist is while i am someone who is truly empathetic you know very sensitive and so on that so that's a good thing that actually would have ended up being uh, you know a death blow to me because if i had to sit and hear about how a you know a, a woman had been you know sexually abused by uncle tom when she was five for seven years you know i would have probably jumped off the ledge ledge eventually because i i wouldn't have been i don't think i would have been able to compartmentalize hearing all this you know diabolical evil and just say okay what are we having for dinner tonight now why am i saying all this because yeah. i actually you know had taken a very deep dive into uh, you know the history of psychiatry and so on and to your point uh you know the early uh psychoanalysts were completely environmental in their approaches so even if you suffered from paranoid schizophrenia then they would say it's because you have a schizophrenic mother which of course is insane because paranoid schizophrenia is an absolute organic disease you give someone a pill all of the hallucinations and and uh, you know uh, voices disappear right uh on the other hand, we now move to your point, to your question, where psychiatry became completely pharmacologically driven. You, you have anxiety, you're having a hard time at work, you're having a sexual dysfunction that could be psychological, here's a pill, here's a pill. And of course, like most things in life, Michael, the, the, the optimal path is somewhere in the middle. There is incredible value in talk therapy. As a matter of fact, cognitive behavior therapy in many instances, and that's been scientifically tested, you know, through usual experimental design. Cognitive behavior therapy in many cases is as effective, if not more effective than throwing a pill at you. Having an empathetic person, whether it be your therapist or a good friend or your mother, uh, can have as much value and efficacy, if not more than, you know, being hit with an, uh, you know, SSRI uh, pill, you know, whatever. So uh, it is very, very important to have these powerful social relationships. As a matter of fact, in the last chapter of the happiness book, I, I, I quote an incredible finding from the, the longest longitudinal study, I think, ever, which is a Harvard adult development study that's been going on for eight plus decades, where they've oh, been wow. studying what is are you familiar with that study? No, but I, I mean, that is that is a lot. That is commitment. That is that is intense data. <laughs> That's commitment. Yeah, yeah. And, and I actually, I, I recently had the director of that, uh, the current director of that longitudinal study on my show. Uh, and they found after eight decades of research, the number one factor for happiness, for well-being, for physical and mental health is the quality of social relationships that you have it is actually more predictive of many metrics of health than your cholesterol scores at 50. so you know when we go see our physician you know he or she takes all of these metrics your sugar level your your cholesterol score your blood pressure yes those are important but they never ask hey are you lonely are you isolated uh, just having a tight group of people that care about you whom you can go to when you have problems, uh, offers an incredible protective belt to your mind and to your body. Um, uh, do, you, do you think it's getting easier or harder for young people, I'm sure it's both in some ways, to find paths to happiness? I mean, I, I think, as you said, I think there are, there are elements tugging you in both directions to that question. Uh, look, for example, social media, uh, which is you know something that people always somehow try to link now with happiness and depression, uh, is both a positive thing and a negative thing. Social media has allowed me to connect with unbelievable people where our worlds would have otherwise never intersected. Yes. Maybe you and I would have never known each other if it were not for social media. And I could probably list another, you know, 100 people, not all of whom have become close friends, but that I really benefited from knowing them. And it only came because of the advent of social media. On the other hand, of course, social media can lead to great unhappiness because take, for example, when you curate your life on Instagram or on Facebook. Well, what are you doing when you're doing that curation? You're basically only putting the positive elements of your right. life. Look at the new car I bought. Look at the beautiful wife I have. Look at the 
exotic place I'm visiting, but you're not curating, you're not posting all of the negative things that are happening in your life. So someone else who is consuming my curated life on social media says, my life sucks. God is only going to exotic places, but they're not seeing some of the troubles that I'm facing. And therefore, because we are a social comparison species, we end up then feeling bad about ourselves because everybody on Facebook and Instagram has a better life than I do. And so I think it's tough to be a young person these days. You know, it's as you said to your earlier point about being 20 and 25 and still, you know, an imbecile, your your personhood is not as solidly defined as yeah. you want it to be. And therefore, yeah, there are all kinds of minefields. Yeah, what, social media, I think, is a great example of this because uh, especially people who are probably fans of ours, you know, 30 years ago, they're going to be the weird kid in high school. But now that weird kid in high school can talk to that other weird kid in the other high school. And now you have a community. I have a picture hanging up in my living room from this band that I adore called St. Etienne. And one of their compilation albums is the title to a Beach Boy song, which I've never heard. But the title is uh, You Need a Mess of Help to Sign Alone. So when I met Bob, I got him to write that. And I think it's kind of, you know, we have this asymmetry where people are encouraged to like be their own island and be, you know, have integrity unto themselves. And that is very, very important. But this kind of isolation that I think a young, a lot of young people face uh, is very, very crippling. Um, and I think that is enormously antithetical toward the, the thriving life and toward seeking happiness. Is that, do you agree with that? I do. And so it, it, in one of the chapters of the current book, uh, it's titled Life as a Playground. And I yeah. talk about the importance of play. It's, you know, you know, in the same way that I need to drink and I need to eat and I need to sleep, I need to play. Now, to, to, to our point about young people, one of the ways by which a very broad range of species learns about some of the evolutionarily relevant tasks that they will have to face is through play. And so when you, for example, you know, when teenagers hit the, the, the stage of teenagehood where, where their peer group somehow becomes more important than their uh, parents, than their siblings, it, it's a natural developmental stage to the chagrin of the parents. And I'm going through that myself uh, because those are a natural developmental process that allows me to try out new social strategies, right? So for example, I've noticed in my children when they're trying out their, their style of humor, sometimes it backfires, just like a stand-up comic who doesn't know whether a yeah. joke is going to land or not. So we're a social species. We need to play with each other. We, not, we need to try different routines with each other. And when you are in isolation, you can't instantiate those developmental programs. That can't lead to a life of flourishment. So how, how, what advice would you have to young people who are feeling completely isolated? And, and like, who, you know, the other thing is I've had, let me give a parallel situation. I had stomach issues all my life, right? Just that was my reality. And I just, okay, this is just how I am. And then I met someone at a job I had and he had Crohn's, right? So this wasn't some hippie with some drink kombucha, you'll be fine. He had a very serious uh, health condition. Um, I, you know, he had to have surgery, so on and so forth. And he had uh, taken probiotics and I'd never heard of such a thing. And I took them and almost immediately my stomach issues, which I faced my entire life, went away. I think a lot of, in terms of seeking happiness, I think a lot of us, and obviously I'm including myself here, if you've been a certain way your life, if you're obese is another one, you think, all right, this is my destiny, this is my fate. And that I think is very deleterious thinking. And it's possible that if someone's obese all their life, they're going to be obese. Okay. But just because you've been 300 pounds, what, you can't be 220? You know, just because you have no friends, but you can't have one friend that you don't really like. So when you put it in terms like that, all of a sudden it's like, okay, I can't be popular, but I could certainly be more popular. I could be less heavy. Um, you know, how do you advise people to get out of these kind of traps? Well I, well, I love that, right? Because I could exactly apply what you just said to the specific example of obesity, right? I lost 86 pounds over the past two years. Uh, you know, I had been an incredibly thin person into m up to my young adult life. I was, a, you know, very competitive soccer player. I was a mar I, well, I say I was a marathon runner. I did two mar I completed two <laughs> marathons. I guess that makes me a marathon runner. Uh, so I was always incredibly lean. And then over the next, you know, two three decades, I slowly put on more and more weight. One day you wake up, oh look, I'm over two hundred pounds. Oh look, I'm over two twenty five. I'm not a tall guy. That's not a really good way, good way to be. And so I 
thought, having tried many times to lose weight, very much I succumbed to the mindset that you said, look, I, I don't know what the black box in my body is, but I can never lose weight. And one of the reasons, exactly to your point, was that it was very, very difficult to see at me ever reaching that end goal, which is losing, you know, 80 pounds. I mean, how the hell am I ever going to lose 80 pounds? Knowing, by the way, that the likelihood of you going on a diet, losing weight and keeping it off is about 5%. So it's it really, right. yeah, I think it's about that. Holy crap. Okay. Someone, if, if I'm wrong, someone I'm sure will correct me, but I think it's around 5%. So it, you really, it's an incredibly losing proposition. And so I changed my mindset, right? I said, look, every single day, there are three things that can happen. There are only three states of the world when it comes to my weight. Whatever decisions I make that day, I will either have increased my weight that day, my weight will have literally not changed by an ounce, right. or I could have decreased my weight. There, there are no possible other events other than these three states of the world. Here's what I'm going to do, Michael. Every single day, I'm going to be in the negative. It, it, may, it may be... 0.2% of an ounce, but, and, and of course my scale can't tell that level of granularity, right, right. but if I've made the right choices, every single day I win the battle of that day, guess what? 18 months later, I get on the scale and I'm unbelievably svelte, not as svelte as when I was 21, but I'm certainly a lean guy. And so how did that happen? It happened in my mind. It yeah. happened by me altering the framing of how I'm going to tackle that decision. So now, which that speaks, because you were saying deterministic, you, I think you used the word deterministic. Early in the book, I basically say, look, about 50% of our individual differences in happiness scores comes from our genes. So I may be born with a sunny disposition, you're born with a less sunny disposition, fine. But the good news is that that still leaves 50% up for yeah. grabs, right? So Again, if you frame it that way, it's not deterministic. There's all of us, irrespective of where we start on our happiness scores, can move in the right direction, to your point. I, I can relate to that because recently I went down to a two-pack instead of a six-pack, so I was basically morbidly obese and had suicidal ideation. But thankfully, they're all back, and, and now I can leave the house without wanting to two jump out in front of, of a bus. beers or cigarettes? My abs. Oh, two-pack in your abs. Oh, I see. Come on, Tubby. <laughs> <laughs> hey folks, Michael Malice here. You might know me as a Twitter troll, terrible author, insufferable podcaster, but I'm also an underwear model and the underwear that I model and wear every day is sheath underwear. If you go to sheathunderwear.com, use promo code MALICE, you get 20% off and you can be inside my pants. Why I love sheath is they have special dual pouch technology for both parts of your male anatomy. It sounds weird. The first time I tried them on, I'm like, what is this? And now I literally wear them every day. The great thing about sheath, it was developed by an Iraq war veteran. And you know, overseas, it gets really, really hot. And Bobby decided, all right, what can I do to make sure I'm not suffering here in this heat? And thanks to his research, you can be comfortable in the comfort of your own home. It's great for cold weather. It's great for hot weather. It keeps you secure and comfortable. And there's something really exciting about going on a job interview, going on a date, doing a podcast, knowing that your underwear has you in its grip, nice and secure and comfortable. Go to sheathunderwear.com, use promo code MALICE, you get 20% off, and you can get one step closer to looking as much like a hunk as myself. Let's get back to the show. Uh, do you think that you are a significantly happier person than you were 10 years ago? And if so, what do you attribute that to? Oh, you know, I've done a million interviews. I've never been, I mean, on happiness, I haven't been asked that question. Uh, I think overall I am happier. My, you know, I've had another 10 wonderful years to be with my wife. And yes, she's in, she's in the next room, but I think she's got the headphones on. So I'm not saying that just to please her. I don't even think she's listening to me. So I'm not blowing she's up her. She listens to you enough. <laughs> like she needs the headphones to Exactly. <laughs> I need a break from, from that loud mouth. Uh, but yeah, so uh, I think I'm happy. I mean, I'm healthier. If, if you yes. if you check my that's a big blood one. Pressure scores today. If you so so you know, health and happiness is a feedback loop. Healthier people do things that cause them to be uh, 
uh, happier and therefore and happier people end up doing things so it's it's really is a feedback loop of like an orgiastic feedback loop of happiness and health so i think from a health perspective knock on wood uh that has made me happier uh i think that professionally you know ev every year my platform and my influence continue to grow i mean that makes me happy not in an egotistical narcissistic sense but i'm in the business of creating knowledge and spreading knowledge right the banker is interested in increasing how much zeros there is in the bank so in my case there are very clear metrics by which i could say look am i am i having a positive influence in the world are, are people appreciating my message and if i compare what it was 10 years ago to today then the answer is going to be a resounding yes i think probably the only thing that uh you know, the only source of, if, if I can put it, unhappiness, at which we've discussed, you and I, maybe publicly, but certainly maybe also privately, is while I love Quebec, while I grew up in, in Quebec after leaving Lebanon, uh, I am desperate to be in a place that's warmer, uh, whether it be in Austin, Texas, or where I am right now, which I consider really my my promised land, Southern California. I'm currently in Newport Beach, where where you know we spent several years here when I was a professor at UC Irvine. So I think uh, if you ask me today, compared to ten years ago, ten years ago I would have told you, oh, ten years from now, I certainly will be in a warmer climate. I will be somewhere sunnier, and I'm not. So that that brings me a lot of angst because although the research incidentally shows that supposedly uh, you know living in Southern California or in a sunny place doesn't necessarily add to your happiness, I can't imagine that. that there must be something wrong with that those studies i haven't looked at them carefully because the second that i you know arrive in orange county my world changes so that would probably be the only thing that i would change that, in my life. that's not possible i'll tell you why it's not possible that those results because as someone who's fled new york the new york winters are so brutal and you talked about the goldfish memory new yorkers forget how bad the winters are and basically the winter keeps going on and on it's often into may and then you're like, I can't do this. I can't handle it. Like you're miserable all the time. You don't want to leave the house to hang out with anyone. Um, it's just awful. It gets dark very early. It's and then you're like, I can't take this. And then spring comes the next day. Like it's this this Lucy with the football with Charlie Brown. So it's impossible to me. And also, you know, as you, I'm sure you know very well, uh, city uh, people who live in these northern latitudes are high, highly correlates with suicide with suicides. So it's not possible to me that having sunshine and being able to leave the house at the very least it's going to correlate with sociability and the possibility of having opportunities and activities so that in and of itself is going to be more conducive towards thriving and a happy life than you know just simply just being st stuck in your house watching kenny versus spenny whatever well it might be and here i'm, I'm completely speculating so uh, i do at, at one point early in the book talk about uh national happiness scores and many of the countries that repeatedly come in the top 10 tend to be northern countries so someone might wrongly presume that you know what's you know that means that hey the fact that i'm in a northern country you know doesn't there's not much sun and there are brutal you know sweden and finland and and yeah. denmark and canada but of course the reason why they end up scoring very high on happiness is be, as a as a culture as a nation is because they have other metrics on which they do so much better than other countries right if if i live in uh, ethiopia where it is a lot nicer weather but i don't think that i'll be able to eat for the next four days then it doesn't take a big fancy social scientist to recognize that my happiness score in ethiopia might be lesser than in finland and so maybe that's why sort of the i don't know if it's a trope that oh, sun doesn't lead to happiness. Maybe that's where it comes from because a lot of the countries that score highest on happiness are actually quite dark and have long winters. There, there's this uh, line that all writing is editing. Um, and when people, young kids ask me for advice, I always tell them, uh, this is this is broad advice I'm comfortable giving to anyone. Strive for competence instead of excellence, especially when you're young. You're not gonna have the capacity to be excellent, but if you're competent and you're reliable, then I can depend on you. You're really going to be at like the 95th percentile because it's shocking to me and you've experienced this as well in your professional life, how comfortable the a vast majority of people are with not doing their job well or, or just not caring or just like, yeah, whatever, I screwed up. Oop, people make mistakes and it's like, yeah, yeah, that's true. But that doesn't mean that any mistake you make, you could just shrug off and be like, well, I'm just going to keep doing this and too bad and someone else has to suffer. So what miss, so since so much of accomplishment in my view, is about simply avoiding 
avoidable mistakes. What mistakes that had you made perhaps when you're younger that have been detrimental towards achieving a happy life? Uh, in, in my personal life and my professional life, Both. Do you, yeah. Are you, anything, but the uh, book's about is, everything, right? It's not just about, you right, know, right, so right, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, again, I don't, I'm trying to think what, what, what might've been some, you know, uh, glaring mistake that I've made. Uh, I don't really have that many, I guess mistakes can be related to a calculus of regret. Oh, I regret that I did this or sure. didn't do that. Uh, which by the way, maybe I could just mention it. I'm not trying to avoid the question, but I'm, I'm trying to think about it. Uh, you know, as you asked it, uh, the, the, the calculus of regret is very interesting in that you basically have two sources of regret. There are regrets due to actions. I, I regret that I cheated on my yeah. wife and now my marriage is over. And then there's regrets due to inaction which is, uh, you know, I regret yep. that I never pursued my interest in, in being an artist, instead became an accountant, and I, I hate accounting. Uh, and it turns out, Michael, that over the long run, long term, the, the most looming regrets that haunt us are regrets due to inaction. And so I'm trying to contextualize your question about mistakes within a calculus of regret. Uh, you know, I, I've said that I regret the fact that I'm not someone who can modulate uh my pathological authenticity because had i been able to do that maybe the university in southern california that otherwise would have wanted to make me an offer decided not to make me that offer because i am so irreverent and direct speaker and so on but then i i shared that regret with a, a very public figure who then uh corrected me and said no it's precisely because you're somewhat irascible and direct speaker that you have the platform that you do. We love exactly that about you. So I'm not sure. I'm kind of torn. On the one hand, I, I regret the fact that I have this, you know, really, truly pathological need to be authentic. Just not need. I, I just, I am authentic versus had I been able to modulate it, I maybe would have been able to be in Southern California. And I'll give another example of, of a similar professional regret. Uh, but again, it can easily be turned back into a, a benefit. So I'm not sure if it's a mistake or not. Uh, in academia, you're always rewarded for being a hyper specialist. You're yeah. expected to be a stay in your lane guy, publish plus Delta studies, because that allows you to have economies of scale. You already know the literature. You already know the methodology that you have to use in your research so you can keep pumping out an additional paper after paper after paper within that very, very small sliver of knowledge. On the other hand, a generalist, a polymath, is someone who just is free, goes around everywhere, right? The reason why I say that Leonardo da Vinci would be the guy that I would want, most want to have dinner with is because he was the ultimate polymath. He's literally the Renaissance man. He's, he's excellent at many different things. Well, I could argue using that calculus that I regret that early in my career, I didn't play the game that I would, that was expected of me. Because had I only published in consumer psychology and psychology of decision-making and a very narrow area of evolutionary psychology uh, as relating to marketing, because I'm in a business school, then the rewards would have come from the university in Southern California. But then even that, I'm not sure was a mistake because had I not been the guy who gets out of my lane, I would have never had the career and the reach that I have. And so I'm torn. Sometimes I think those were professional mistakes. Other times I think they're exactly the, the decisions that I made that allowed me to be able to be speaking to Michael Malice today. What, what about this? We're both midgets. So for you to be over 225, uh, was that something where you were a, like a jolly fat person? Or I imagine that there were like lots of things that went along with it in terms of just functionality in life that certainly would have had a negative effect on being happy. Uh, okay, well, first, let me correct the midget statement. I am the height of Lionel Messi, so I think I'm okay. Number one, I am the perfect height for being a great soccer player, so that's also perfect. I'm the perfect height for getting an exceptionally beautiful woman whom you've met. Yes, so that's true. I, I can validate this. So I, He's nothing above his height and weight. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, look, uh, Frankly, one of the reasons why I allowed my weight to balloon the way that it did. And, and, and Pun I, intended. Sorry? Pun intended. Unint right. Pun intended. Unintended. Pun, 
Han. Oh, pun intended. Sorry, sorry. I, I can't Balloon. hear you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Uh, is because I didn't have my my personhood, maybe again to a fault, was so unconcerned with those kinds of vanity issues that I present. So when I present myself to the world, to your earlier point about also the height, I'm 17 feet tall, right? Okay. My, my personhood, my self-assuredness, my confidence uh, is such that, you know, I really do present myself to the world in a, in a, in a way that, that doesn't recognize that I was 225 or that I'm not six foot four. Uh, but I think that was a detriment because had I been a bit more vain so that when I look at the mirror, I go, what a fat whale you are. Why don't you get it together? <laughs> then maybe I would have autocorrected earlier. Now, of course, now that I have lost that weight, uh, you know, I do post photos where I say, look at this felt gorgeous guy. So, you know, we all have a bit of an ego, but I wish I had more of a vein strain because it would have never allowed me to get to 200 and 225. But it's in, I, I'm not even talking from a vanity perspective. I, I, when you get to that weight, at, aren't there just in terms of just functionality, in terms of aren't you out of breath more, weren't you tired more, uh, finding clothes that fit, and, and just, just it, things like this? I would imagine there are other consequences as well. Frankly, the, the, the number one thing that I remember that was you know, most difficult to do was just to tie your shoelaces. Yeah. You know, that, you know, I, I could, yeah, I mean, you know, I wasn't 90 years old. How come I can't reach? <laughs> right. right. So that, I think probably that's the one that what, you know, it's, it's a banal thing, but yet it's so telling, right? I mean, if you can't tie your shoelaces, maybe you need to go on a diet. How about that? And so, uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it's so liberating to be able to be a thinner. Now that's, that said, I do suffer from other, uh, if you like physical constraints that have nothing to do with weight. I have uh, three herniated discs, uh, which were diagnosed, you know, more than 10, 12 years ago. And I had gone to see a, a physiatrist, uh, you know, to help me who, who had taken the MRI images to, to them to show that I do have those herniated discs. And when I said, okay, doc, so what, what, what do I do? He said, okay, well, here's my medical advice. Never, ever, ever again bend. I said, that's it. That's the medical school advice. He said, no, but that's literally true. Never. So in other words, it's been now 12 years that whenever, say, I drop something, I always do the, you know, the knee lunge as if you're, you're going on your knee to, to yeah. propose to a woman. Uh, I never bend my back because that can easily cause the slippage. But how do you tie your shoes then? You have to tie, you bend to tie your shoes, right? So I usually will find a, a platform where I can put up. Oh, you know, wow. One leg after another. I never, ever, ever, even when my kids were younger and, you know, I would have had to bend a bit to pick them up. I never do it. And so that actually speaking about, you know, the importance of freedom, usually we refer to it as, you know, freedom of speech and freedom of conscience that mobility free or lack of freedom yeah. is something that I have found very difficult to handle. So even when I, you know, I play a lot of sports, I've tried to go back and play soccer. It's very difficult to do because I'm, there's always a voice in the back of my head. Don't tilt beyond a certain point when you're picking up the ball, because that could be the point that sends you into five days of excruciating pain. Have you ever heard that story that Napoleon used the Egyptian Sphinx for target practice and shot its nose off? Or maybe you've heard that a French astrologer named Nostradamus correctly predicted nearly 500 years of human history. Or maybe someone told you that the legendary blues guitarist Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil at a crossroads in Mississippi. These stories are what I like to call historical myths, great little tales that may or may not have any basis in historical fact. On Our Fake History, we explore these historical myths and try to determine what's fact, what's fiction, and what is such a good story, it simply must be told. If you dig stories about death-obsessed emperors, lost civilizations, desperate sieges, voodoo black magic, and famous historical figures you thought you knew, then Our Fake History might just be your new favorite podcast. 
If you dig it, then subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You're Welcome with Michael Malice is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Folks, most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, you're listening to me talk, but you're also driving, cleaning, exercising, maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you could be doing right now, which is getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you can save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Let's get back to the show. Another tricky thing is that the mind makes correlations where they aren't necessarily there. And one of the points I've made is we all think, I, I, I would say we, I will say everybody, I used to think this as well. Whatever we like least about ourselves, we choose to blame for our problems. So you'll have other guys who are perfect heights like us who will be like, oh, I can't get a girlfriend because I'm too short, or I can't get a girlfriend because I'm too heavy, right? Even though there's no shortage of midgets with beautiful women, no shortage of fat guys with beautiful women, but that's what they like least about themselves, so that's what they blame. It's really hard to decoup women especially. It's just like, oh, okay, you know, uh, it's my looks. It's like It could be that you're just a bitch. And it's, it's, you know, it's, if you were prettier, you'd still be a bitch and maybe people would tolerate you more and tell you you're funny, but that's, that's the problem. It's very, very hard for us to decouple self-perception and, you know, utility in terms of interacting with other people and, and thriving in life. Can you speak on that? And, and, uh, yeah. do, do you agree? Yeah. So that, uh, and, uh, another great question. So I have a chapter in the, in the book or one of the early chapters where I talk about the two most important decisions that you can make that either impart great happiness to you or great misery. And we've already, I think, talked a bit about uh, uh, the job one, you know, or I can't remember if it was on, in, in this conversation. So if, for the job, you know, pick, a, pick a, uh, a profession that hopefully allows you to instantiate yourself within the creative impulse. So whether yes. you're a stand-up comic or a podcaster or an author or an architect or a chef, each of those people are in completely different domains. But they, but before they came along, there was something that didn't exist, and then because they put their creative input into it, here is a gorgeous dish, here is a beautiful bridge, Amen. Yep. here is a beautiful conversation, right? So that okay, so I put that aside. The, the second part of that chapter is you know finding the optimal mate, and so in that chapter, I speak exactly about the point that you made, you know shorter guys having beautiful women, fatter guys having beautiful women. And there, if I can use the, the fancy language of, of science, mate choice is a compensatory process. What does that mean? If mate choice were a non-compensatory process, it would be the following. If, a, if all women said, I will never mate with a man who is under six feet tall, that's a non-compensatory statement. Because what is that saying? If you fall short, forgive the pun, of that six foot mark, I have zero chance of being able to flip you and convince you that I'm a good man. Right. It's non-compensatory. I cannot compensate for my shortcomings by scoring very highly on other qualities. But luckily for most of us, all people, the fact that mate choice is compensatory, it means that when we're choosing a mate, it's really, we're looking at the optimal bundle, right? So I can be shorter, but if I am humorous, if I'm ambitious, if I have high social status, you know, if uh, I'm maybe good looking, I can compensate for the fact that I may not be tall. Now, there are some mating attributes that we can't do anything about. My facial symmetry is my facial symmetry. My yeah. height is my height. But boy, let's suppose I were single. Uh, being 86 pounds lighter uh, is certainly going to increase the likelihood of women finding me attractive putting aside all the other attributes or faults that I may have. And so 
that's really a powerful message of personal agency because it says it doesn't matter where you think you are in terms of your mating value. To our earlier point, remember when I said your weight could either go up, stay the same, or go down. I could every day make certain decisions that at least ameliorate my lot in the mating market. That's a very powerful, empowering message. What was it, if it wasn't vanity, what was it that gave you the idea that, hold on, this, this weight's out of control. I got to do something about this. Oh, that's why I love talking to you. We, we get down to the nitty gritty. Well, so here I'm going to share with you a story. I think that I've maybe only shared once before on the Joe Rogan show, That that's, that's a rough show to, 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 to open up about a personal issue. So yes. this was not the latest time I appeared on Joe Rogan. It was the, the time before about uh, two, two, and a, two summers ago. So when I was sort of starting on my weight loss journey, but was still a lot heavier, or maybe it was three summers ago, I can't remember. Uh, out of the blue, we were driving, uh, heading, we meaning my wife and kids, dri were driving to our favorite Peruvian rotisserie chicken place to have rotisserie chicken. The reason I say that is, is because th there was nothing stressful happening to me. I wasn't yeah. caught up in any thought processes. And out of the blue, I started getting symptoms. My fingers were tingling. My, I was getting short of breath. I said, oh my God, I mean, what's happening? Am I having a heart attack? What's happening? We drive to, we actually pulled off to the side. I started walking back and forth saying, I, I can't breathe. You know, I'm, my fingers are tingling. Uh, we drive to the hospital. Actually, the attending emergency physician turns out to be a fan. He does every single possible test you could imagine. He says, uh, you know, I'm sorry, Professor Sad, but it was a panic attack. And now I started thinking, okay, well, I never had that before. I've never, you know, had anxiety problems and so on. Uh, I started thinking, well, what the hell could have caused this? Now, I'm going to come to your question. I'm setting it up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just about five minutes earlier or two minutes earlier, I see a bus pass by, a city bus with the signs, you know, uh, here are the signs that you're having a stroke or something. Be, make sure that your blood pressure is right, right? And I have always suffered from health anxiety, meaning that whenever I go to the physician, it's always, okay, tell me, doc, am, am I dead in one week, right? I always, right? Is it over? Is the party over, right? And so I thought, you know what? I'm actually carrying two sets of weights. I'm carrying excess weight. And I'm carrying this huge, actually much bigger weight of psychological weight of the fact that I'm always worried that the fact, because I am a perfectionist, the fact that I'm having this extra weight is only putting the odds against me. And I need to not only lose my physical weight, I need to lose this really anxiety inducing psychological weight. And I said, that's it. I've got a nip it in the butt. And so to answer your question, that's how I ended up losing the weight. If if I can get a little slightly personal, uh, did your yeah. wife encourage you? Was she like, oh, I want to say something. Thank God you came to this conclusion. Like, how, how does that, how does that do? I mean, uh, you can understand the question. She's never, yes. So she was very instrumental in my weight loss, but not in the, in the gist of how you pose the question. So it wasn't the type, hey, fat whale lose some weight so I can find you attractive again if you want to get sexy time. It was never that. It was, <laughs> no you're, you're gorgeous. <laughs> you're gorgeous. You are the epitome of manhood. No man has ever been created who is as sexy as you know. I'm, I'm actually embellishing those. She never said those things. But uh, it was actually, she was absolutely instrumental in my weight loss because she was the one who would enter every single calorie that oh, wow. I consumed in a given day using a, an app so that, I mean, literally when she's cooking, when she's making my salad, she can tell you it, yep. the, the number of ounces of olive oil. It was one and yep. a half tomato. So that at the end of the day, she'll say, you're at 1,632 calories. Don't have another snack because we've reached your limit. Yeah. So the fact that I had someone who was, tracking me yes. akin to the Gestapo, frankly, uh, was actually the way by which I was held accountable to my behavior. So there was really a couple of secrets to my weight loss. Number one, 
walk or exercise 15 to 20,000 steps, but that really is only about 10% of your weight loss. 90% of your weight loss comes from what goes into your mouth. Yes. And, and she is the one who's telling me, you're at 1582, you're at 1795, you've eaten an extra 100 calories today, you've got to nip it in the bud. If I didn't have that mechanism, I would have never lost weight. So she was absolutely fundamentally instrumental in me losing weight. I eat the same thing every day. Uh, I have a few calories that I can work with so that, you know, to use to put toward whatever, but willpower is a finite resource. So the reason a lot of these so-called diets don't work is if you're going to have to constantly fight your willpower at a certain point, you're going to lose just like every, the strongest man on earth has a weight he cannot lift. And then what happens is you get this cycle. It's like, all right, I, I screwed up today. Let me just go all in and binge. And then it just becomes dominoes and it's, it's a horrific situation. Can you give us like two or three uh, um, bad eating habits that you had that by, I'm sure by just two or three changes, so much of this just solved itself? Absolutely. Uh, the constant grazing yes. is, is insane. Right? Yes. I've just had a great meal at six o'clock. I took a frozen mango at eight shut it down, stop eating. Whereas my usual thing, I, I, and actually, I, so I, I can't definitively state this, but you know, looking back at my historical pattern of behavior, it would not be an exaggeration to say that given that I sleep very late at night, you know, 1230, one o'clock in the mornings when I go to bed, between the time that we, this is, I'm talking now when I was heavier, between the yeah. time of us having had dinner to the time of me going to sleep, it would not be an exaggeration to say that I've had five to 800 additional calories. Wow. Now, it's not as though I'm eating, you know, pig lard, but you know, here's a bowl of popcorn coming your way. Now let's have a little menushe. Menushe is a type of kind of Arabic bread thing that you roll up. And so it's little things, but when you add up those oh, little yeah. things, ends up being, 700 calories. Well, do nothing else other than stop eating at eight and remove those 700 calories. Hey, guess what happens? You lose weight. So I think overwhelmingly uh, being accountable to the scale, you know, I would go years without weighing myself precisely because of the anxiety that it would induce me if I, I so the guy who wrote the, the chapter on ostrich parasitic syndrome was the biggest ostrich in the world, right? I put my head metaphorically in the sand and say, I, I don't want to know what my weight is. And so weighing myself once a week, being accountable for my daily caloric intake, uh, not grazing after eight o'clock, suddenly I'm a lean, svelte guy. You know, isn't that such a bizarre um, trope, the ostrich burying its head in the sand? First of all, it's completely not true. But second, ostriches don't live on sure. beaches. They don't live on, They don't live near sand anyway. And, and I don't think it would be easy even for something as strong as an ostrich. Sand is not something where you could just punch and you know go through it. It's And how's it going to breathe? It, none of it makes sense. And yet this has become a trope. It's a very, very bizarre one. I, I wonder what the etymology yeah. of that uh, um, could be. Um, I am, I'm glad to see you smiling and I'm glad, you know, I dedicated the anarchist handbook to my friend, Eric Dixon, who had real health issues all his life because of his weight. He passed away at an early age in the early forties. So whenever I hear friends of mine who sit down and are like, you know what, maybe I'm not going to be an underwear model, but I'm certainly going to be a lot healthier than I am today. And they do something about it. My friend, Lisa, shout out to her as well. I, I think it's just absolutely terrific. It's, I'll just tell you one thing that you'll really appreciate. I've been spending some time recently with Roseanne Barr, um, and it's a complete joy because she's the only person who I feel comfortable making fat jokes to their face because she's not fat any longer, but this was her brand for many years. So we were, and she has no pretend, she's much less pretentious than either of us, but it's even though she's in a complete position to be, you know, absolute icon and legend. So we're on the plane. And she turns to me and she goes, you know, after, after stuffing my, I'm not going to do the voice, but after stuffing my face like a pig all day, I'm just going to go home and take a long nap. I go, as a pig. And she just completely <laughs> lost it. Um, but it's just so great when you see, because she also realized, look, you know, when you're heavy, you reach a certain age, you don't see people in their 80s who are obese. You know, the, yeah. this, this whole movement about healthy at every size is a complete lie and it's really uh, uh, sets up bad habits for people who are going to face 
uh, coffins far earlier than they should. So kudos to you. And also, I'm sure your family is delighted to know uh, how much better this has done uh, uh, for your health because they want you around as, as much as possible. Um, the book the, the book is called The Sad Truth About Happiness. Gad, we're running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? Uh, probably the part where you, what, what, what was the part where I said to you, uh, that's why I like talking to you because you asked these poignant personal questions. What was it? That wasn't the one where you said that your, what did your wife help? Or, what, I think it was, I think that was that part. Uh, yeah. that was, so that probably was it because, you know, uh, I think one of the reasons why, uh, you know, many people connect with my message is that I'm not afraid to share of my personhood right yes. i'm not some fancy professor in the ivory tower that you can't reach i'll communicate with people who have four four followers on twitter i, I don't have that contrary to what you said about being pretentious i actually think i'm quite a down to it there is a self-aggrandizing that's part of sure. my brand but uh in reality i i, I want to connect with people and so i think that when someone asks me these poignant personal questions that allow people to get to know me better uh I'm happy to share. When I shared the story about having a panic attack, I could easily think to myself, oh, I shouldn't share that story because then that makes me seem as though I'm less of a impenetrable honey badger. But then I thought about it and I thought, but wait a minute, actually it is a honey badger who yes. has the strength to be able to share that yes. weakness. And so so I think probably the, the parts that I enjoy most in our conversation today is where, you, you know, using the framework of happiness, you ask me personal questions. You are welcome.